आईटी शुरू कर दीजिए हेलो अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू एवरी वन to the sixth webinar of the series on the history of international law fall 2020 organized by the center for international legal studies at jindal global law school of op jindal global university in india we are very pleased to have professor dr hushang shehabi who agreed to join us as the key speaker for today's talk on semi colonial iran a century of humiliation and i am ajita sharma stepping in as a moderator for this talk so let me introduce a very uh, distinguished guest uh, professor hushang who is a leading scholar of iranian studies at the uh, frederick s pardee school of global studies uh, at Bo boston university he is uh, there he is a professor of international relations and history he has also held academic positions at harvard university oxford university university of st andrews ucla uh, and uade in argentina and has acquired prestigious fellowships from alexander von humboldt and woodrow wilson's uh, uh, foundations uh, professor hushang uh, is iranian german born in tehran uh, in iran he has received both his ma and phd from yale university his research primarily focuses on the history culture and politics of iran and its neighboring countries and he situates them in a wider international and comparative framework uh, his research is uh, published in edited books journals he has also published uh, previously and uh, let me just share uh, his uh, uh, sorry uh his uh latest book that uh is going to be out uh in a few days uh so uh thank you professor hushang and uh uh the floor is yours now thank you very much uh for this kind uh, introduction uh i am not a lawyer Uh, I have studied plenty of international law as part of my education in international relations, uh, uh, both uh, on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. But um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so what uh, this talk will be about uh, is uh, Iran's uh, diplomacy, in a sense, uh, from 1828 to 1928. Uh, a word about the title: it's of course a reference to uh, the Chinese. a uh, century of humiliation which uh, lasted 110 years uh, from uh, uh, 1839 to 1949 at least in the eyes of the current power, power holders uh, iran century however uh, lasted exactly 100 years uh, from 1828 to uh, 1928 but i should also mention that the term century of humiliation is not actually used uh, in iranian uh, historiography uh and uh, why in 1828 because it's in that year that uh, iran was forced to sign a treaty with russia that inaugurated its status uh, as a uh, as the lawyers of the 19th century would have it semi civilized state or uh, as uh, people who are more interested in imperialism and colonialism and economic penetrations uh our uh want to say the semi colonial status of iran what do i mean by these words um by the early 19th century international law has uh, had its uh, was beginning to have its positivist uh, turn uh, the result was that a, a standard of civilization was held up to those few non european polities that had managed to conserve their Uh, sovereignty iran siam china japan uh, etc a very few of them actually and uh, those countries were routinely called semi civilized in the anglo saxon world um so um and when you read the international law manuals of the 19th century you always see this group of five countries you always see uh, china japan siam iran and the ottoman empire as being in a category by themselves they were sovereign in the sense that uh european signed treaties with them but these were not equal treaties uh very often and they were not recipro reciprocal 
So uh, with this uh, introduction, how did Iran get there? Uh, because until the early 18th century, uh, Europeans dealt with uh, Iran uh, as an equal. Um, Alexandrovich, uh, who apparently uh, featured in one of your previous uh, meetings, has an interesting article uh, in which he uh, discusses a treaty concluded in 1631 uh, between Persia and the Netherlands, uh, which was on the basis of strict reciprocity. Um, Persian subjects received the same rights in Amsterdam as Dutch merchant, uh, merchants received in Isfahan, right? Uh, but the 18th century uh, was a century of upheavals in Iran. There were incessant civil wars. And by the late 18th century, when a winner finally emerged, the founder of the Rajar dynasty, the country lay in ruins, literally in ruins. Travelers tell us that wherever they went, uh, the, the cities lay in ruins as a result of all the wars. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, while Iran was sort of uh, you know, decaying, Russia had of course emerged as a major European power thanks to the reforms of Peter the Great and it was expanding southwards. And so the reconsolidation of the Iranian polity coincided with the beginning of the imperial age, which Iran was far much less equipped to face than China uh, or Japan, uh, because uh, the state was so recent. Uh, there was no bureaucracy, it had to be created. Um, to make a long story short, uh, the uh, reconsolidation of the Iranian state came in touch with Russia's southward move, uh, and uh, the result was two wars, uh, both of which uh, ended in disastrous treaties for Iran. Um, they could have been, the result could have been much more disastrous. I mean, uh, Russia could easily have uh, conquered all of Iran except that during the first war with Iran, Russia was also involved in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and in the second one, a tension with the Ottoman Empire uh, occurred and soon afterwards a war. Uh, therefore, it is basically international diplomacy elsewhere that saved the sovereignty of Iran and uh, uh, prevented its, uh, its total capture by uh, the Russians. And so could I please have image one? Sorry, okay, so uh, I will go on. Uh, on image one, uh, you will see the uh, territories that uh, Iran had to cede to Russia in, um, uh, in 1828. And so basically these treaties of Turkmen Chai uh, have uh, the same function in Iranian diplomatic history. Here you see the Northern Territory. Uh, as uh, the uh, treaties uh, signed after the Opium War uh, between China and uh, the West, uh, they were a shock to the system because suddenly the leaders of the country realized uh, that they were at a huge disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, Europeans. Now, uh, one, the uh, treaties of uh, Turkmen of 1828 and the previous one enshrined a few things. One is capitulation. Uh, commercial advantages for Russian merchants, extraterritoriality for Russian subjects, the right to establish consulates uh, everywhere. Uh, these treaties even regulated the etiquette to be observed at court uh, for the Russian ambassador in uh, Tehran. By the same token, uh, Iran also lost the right to navigation in the Caspian Sea, which is of course this big lake uh, connecting Iran and uh, Russia. Uh, the Caspian Sea became a Russian lake incident. And then in 1829, we get the Grubayedov affair. Uh, this was occasioned uh, by uh, an Iranian mob that killed the Russian minister to Iran, the famous writer and essayist Alexander Grubayedov, uh, who was killed uh, along other members of the Russian embassy uh, when they tried to uh, forcefully take um, women out of uh, the um, households of Iranians. These women had been uh, captured Christians from the Caucasus who had converted to Islam. Uh, 
uh, and who had been converted to Islam, and the Russians wanted them back, uh, and uh, a, a, a sort of scuffle resulted, and they were killed. Now, if it hadn't been for the Russo-Ottoman war going on at the same time, there might have been tremendous retaliation. But in this case, uh, the delegation, uh, uh, the Russians were uh, content with an official delegation from Iran, where the um, uh, grandson of the Iranian Shah actually went to St. Petersburg to apologize. And um, one thing he took with him, could I have image two, please? One thing we, uh, he took with him was this diamond, you see, it's known as the Shah diamond, which uh, the um, uh, Shah offered to uh, Tsar Nicholas I. Now, this diamond sort of exemplifies the decline of Iran because it had come to Iran after Nader Shah had looted the Mughal treasury in his rampage in uh, 1839. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, in Delhi, uh, 40 kilometers from the uh, uh, from the uh, campus of uh, Jindal, Uni of Jindal University, and um, this was now uh, presented to the Tsar. It's, it can still be seen in the Kremlin, in the Museum of the Kremlin. And so, in 90 years, in a span of 90 years, Iran had gone from a regional power that conquered all neighboring states, including Delhi to one which was being humiliated by uh, the Russians uh, in this way. Now, soon after the unequal treaties with uh, Russia, the, on the basis of the most favored nation principle, Iran had to sign similar treaties with other countries. Uh, the most important being Britain, of course, but uh, also uh, France, Europe, and so on, uh, opening it up to commerce uh, and uh, for foreign countries, extraterritoriality, and all of these things. However, on the whole, Iran was far too poor to attract much business. Uh, and the numbers of European merchants active was much lower than, say, in Egypt, the Ottoman Empire, or China. Uh, one result was that there were no mixed courts, for instance. Disputes between subjects of the capitulary powers and the Persians were adjudicated by tribunals headed by an official of the Iranian foreign ministry. The foreign ministry had uh, officials in every town where consuls and foreign merchants resided, and they would put together an ad hoc committee, including representatives from the consulates to try such cases. Now, the British tried, would have liked to have mixed courts of the same kind that you had in Egypt, but they didn't press the issue because it was not worth the effort. The other result of the uh, capitulations was, of course, a protege system. Uh, in Iran, too, uh, hundreds and thousands of Iranian subjects put themselves under protection under the foreign power. And if they were merchant, that gave them automatically an advantage over those merchants uh, who were uh, subject of, the, um, of Iran uh, only. Um, and it was very common, for instance, for uh, Muslims to add uh, the suffix of to their name, Hamidov, Aliyov, uh, Muhammadov, uh, etc., uh, to signify that they were now subjects of the Tsar and were entitled to extraterritorial uh, rights. Now, what saved Iran's sovereignty was its status as a buffer state between the expanding Russian and British Empire. Uh, the British were essentially interested in Iran and its sovereignty primarily because it was the gatekeeper to India. Uh, a Persia under Russian control would have been a threat uh, to India, uh, and Iran thus became one of the arenas of the famous Great Game uh, for control over Asia, with both sides, both Britain and Russia, meddling in Iranian affairs to block uh, the other. Uh, this led to uh, two conflicts between Iran and Britain, actually, because having been thwarted by the Russians in the north, as we saw, the Rajas turned the attention to the west and the east. Um, on two occasions, they uh, set out to add Herat to their domain, and both times the British intervened, occupying areas in the south of Iran uh, and forcing Iran to... Uh, to give up its campaign to gain Herat uh, in order to see the evacuation of the area seized by the British. Herat eventually in 1862 was added to Afghanistan. 
The Qatars did not give up. Now they turned their attention south and gained a part of Baluchistan. Uh, in Baluchistan, uh, there originally had been a very decentralized uh, polity with various Khans, various tribal leaders playing a balancing game between the ruler of Kalat, the British, the Rajars, and Oman, uh, the empire of Oman uh, to the south. And the British did not see their interests threatened and uh, led Persian forces uh, to uh, subdue uh, the Khans and oust the Omanis from Iran's southern uh, shores. Um, and there is an interesting comparison with China because even though uh, China, in the middle of its so-called century of humiliation, consolidated its rule over eastern Turkestan, uh, which it turned into the new province, uh, i.e. Xinjiang. Uh, Iran also gained a new province as a result of its deal with Britain, um, and uh, that was Baluchistan, the Iranian part of uh, Baluchistan. Uh, this was actually brokered by a British official in India, Frederick John Goldsmith, uh, who had been, uh, who had supervised the laying of telegraph lines in Iran. Now, why did Iran have telegraph lines? Because the British wanted to connect India and Britain. So the telegraph lines had to go through uh, Iran. Um, and so in a sense, you could argue that communications inside Iran were improved thanks to uh, colonialism. And this of course helped not only the state uh, which allowed it to you know, gradually extend its actual control over peripheral areas when you could be in daily contact with these peripheral areas. It also had another consequence, which was uh, it uh, consolidated the hierarchy of the 12 Shi'i clergy uh, in Iran uh, because uh, people could now be, uh, individual believers could now be in touch with uh, the mujtahids and uh, the leaders of the faith. And uh, this led to the establishment of a more or less centralized hierarchy a hierarchy that, as we all know, took power in Iran in 1979. Uh, the only equal with which Iran dealt was the Ottoman Empire. Not really an equal in power terms or in economic terms, but the Ottomans were occupied with Russia and uh, Europe. And so the eastern fringes of it, namely the areas bordered in Iran, were basically its backwaters. And so in the 1840s, uh, the two countries, uh, the two empires signed a number of treaties, the Erzurum treaties that ended their centuries old hostilities. They realized that as the last two Muslim states, independent sovereign states in the world, they had to bury the hatchet because they faced a common enemy in the, in, in, uh, with European imperialism. And so they made peace uh, with each other. And interestingly enough, in 1875, they tried, uh, they, uh, they uh, signed a treaty in which each side gave the other extraterritorial rights. So uh, the, uh, this is a case of sort of reciprocal extraterritoriality, uh, where Ottomans residing in Iran and Iranian subjects residing in the Ottoman Empire had uh, received extraterritorial rights. Now, at this point, gradually, the Iranian elites become um, aware of the tremendous weakness of the country vis-a-vis -vis outsiders because they travel abroad, they travel to Georgia. Many people were resident in Istanbul. They were uh, admirers of the Tanzimat reforms, uh, which were sort of more acceptable to Iranians because they had been uh, enacted in a Muslim country. Um, so there were reforms, uh, attempts at reform in Iran, but the general thrust of uh, history was that the reforms did not pan out. Uh, they were never uh, really, they never went as far as they did in the Ottoman Empire. The rulers of the country, the kings were not interested in parting with their powers. And so the establishment of a Rechtsstaat, of a, uh, of a state based on law with the constitution, with written codes, etc., was constantly deferred in the 19th century. Um, in spite of this weakness, uh, the uh, state tried to be uh, active. Uh, Raja Shahs paid lots of visits to Europe uh, where they were actually received as equals. Uh, can I have image three, please? Here you see uh, Nasser ad Din Shah uh, meeting Queen Victoria in, uh, in Britain. Uh, as you can see, his head is covered. Uh, so the, uh, the degree to which Iranians uh, accepted European etiquette uh, 
uh, was limited. He has a perfectly European uh, uh, suit, but uh, he still is, his head is still covered according to Muslim uh, etiquette. And they hope that uh, if they were received by the Europeans uh, as equals, this would translate into European respect for the sovereignty of their country. Uh, we have the same thing with King Trulalongkorn's uh, visits to uh, Europe, uh, for instance. At the same time, uh, Iran also joined the first uh, international organizations, the Universal Postal Union, the International uh, Telegraph Union, um, all of these were attempts to uh, signify to the rest of the world that we are a, a sever uh, sovereign uh, state. Um, they also tried to uh, resist encroachment uh, by the Europeans. They were in a weak position, so they used the weapons of the weak by sort of... Uh, uh, you know, agreeing to something and then changing their minds, dragging their feet, etc. It took years for the British uh, to uh, gain a concession for navigation on Iran's only navigable river, the Karun. Um, and uh, here I want to, uh, to uh, uh, quote Lord Curzon, who at one point, of course, as you all know, became vice Viceroy of India. Uh, he uh, uh, said after, you know, much diplomatic arm twisting uh, had wrested a, uh, an agreement from the Shah of Iran to let them organize uh, to have British vessels on the river. He said, quote, the opening of this route should result in an enormously increased import into Persia of British and Anglo-Indian goods. The cities of southern and central Persia already derive the bulk of their luxuries and almost the whole of their clothing from Manchester or Bombay. And each fresh town that is brought into communication with the Persian Gulf will thereby be drawn into the mesh of the Lancashire cotton spinner or the Hindu artisan. So um, at the expense of whom? At the expense of Iranian artisans, of course. Uh, whose uh, production uh, didn't have the economies of scale that British production had and to lost out. So uh, gradually, to make a long story short, um, there uh, was a movement in Iran uh, to, uh, to end the despotism of the kings, to uh, have a state of law, to uh, have a constitution. And um, while this is happening towards the end of the 19th century, uh, foreign interference grows. Russian and British interference in Iran grows. And in 1899, Lord Salisbury uh, observed that Britain still interfered, interfered with the Persian government much more than those of South America, China, or Sia. Uh, and um, so this is interesting. Iran was in a weaker position than China and Siam. And he's, he added that in the Persian case, even giving advice about the appointment and dismissal of provincial governors, whether or not direct British interests were involved. So a, uh, a sovereignty which is really uh, punct punctured by outside interference. This led to uh, this general sense of economic malaise and European interference and local despotism led to the first constitutional revolution uh, in a Muslim country, the 1906 uh, revolution, uh, and to the second constitution in a Muslim state, because the Ottoman constitution was much older, but had been um, put on ice uh, at this point. And uh, Iranians hoped that a, con a constitution would strengthen the state, lead to uh, Iran being able to, uh, to limit uh, or even end interference from foreign powers, uh, create legal codes, which could then be used to argue that there is no longer any raison d'etre for the for extraterritoriality, for the capitulations, and thereby lead to the abolition of the capitulation. However, uh, the constitutionalists were uh, disappointed because this all coincides with a redrawing of uh, the geopolitical map in uh, Europe uh, Germany was uh, at this point a rising power. Uh, 
uh, the German Empire. And uh, so uh, uh, the British started uh, thinking in terms of uh, countering the German rise by making deals with their former rivals, uh, namely the French uh, and to a lesser extent, the Italians and so on. And so at this point, we get a new uh, concept in the history of imperialism, and that's a zone of influence. Zone of influence, a sphere of influence, which had first been defined in legal terms uh, in the 1885 uh, Berlin Agreement about uh, dividing Africa, because Article 34 of that uh, treaty uh, used the term sphere of influence for the first time. So uh, this was the first time that this term actually appeared in a legal document. And imperialism, uh, as J.A. Hobson, the great theorist of imperialism wrote, was now, I quote, a whole siding scale of terms from hinterland and sphere of influence to effective occupation and annexation. Um, and this advance was now regulated by international law, uh, the 1885 treaty. And uh, so, uh, as I said, faced with uh, a resurgent German empire, the French and the British decided to gang up on it. And of course, one of the first results of it is the Entente Cordiale of 1904, which cemented the British Franco-British uh, alliance. And if you read the three declarations that uh, came forth from this Entente Cordiale of 19, uh, 1904, all are about delineating zones of influence in what remained in Asia and Africa, uh, including, by the way, the division of Siam into two uh, zones of influence. Then in December 1906, Britain, France, and Italy signed a treaty to divide Ethiopia into spheres of influence. Uh, and um, can I have uh, uh, image four now, please? And this uh, gradual sort of uh, um, control that uh, uh, Russia um, had uh, in Iran, because Russia got by far the, uh, the greater part of uh, this, uh, uh, this division, uh, let even in, was observed even in Japan. This is a poster drawn by Japanese students in 1905 and you see the Russian octopus strangling uh, the smaller countries to the south. Uh, the third tentacle from the right is strangling Persia. The fourth one is, is holding the feet of, uh, the, uh, of Turkey. Uh, they are strangling China, Tibet, um, uh, and uh, so on. So Russia was the big, uh, Russia was the imperial power that was on the border of Iran. Uh, whereas Britain was, you know, in Britain, it was a colonial empire that was uh, bordering on Iran. So uh, after Siam and Ethiopia in 1907, finally the British and the Russians signed the Anglo-Russian Convention to delineate their respective spheres of influence uh, in Iran and in the rest of Asia. And this was of course done over the head of the uh, Iranian uh, government. The Iranian government had no say uh, in the division of the country by uh, the Anglo-Russian treaty. So could I have the next image, please, image number five? And this was uh, noticed uh, in Britain. Uh, so in the famous magazine Punch, you had this caricature uh, where the British lion and the British bear uh, sort of deal with a Persian cat. This is, of course, a, a play on the Persian cats. And uh, as you see, uh, the last line of the legend says, the cat says, the Persian cat says, I don't remember having been consulted about this. So uh, this is uh, basically a, uh, uh, a, an illustration of the semi-sovereign uh, status uh, of Iran uh, at this point. Asia was now completely divided. Can I have image six, please? Here you see the zones of influence, and it's interesting to compare Siam and Persia. In uh, Siam, you get a French zone of influence uh, in the vicinity of French Indochina, and uh, a British zone of influence in the vicinity of Burma and Malaya. In Iran, you get exactly the same uh, principle as Brit uh, British zone close to British, uh, close to British India, 
and a Russian zone uh, close to Russia. Now, as you see here, <coughs> the Russia, Russians really got the better deal. The Russians got the better deal. The north of the country was much more prosperous. Tehran, where the court and the government were in the Russian zone, uh, the British basically got a piece of desert in the southeast of uh, the country. But again, all they cared for was the security of India. They didn't care about the rest of the country. Therefore, what mattered to them was to control the, uh, the gateway to uh, British India, uh, if you like. Now, what this entailed was what this zone of influence as defined by the 1907 convention entailed was spelled out by Lord Curzon, uh, by now former Viceroy of India, who in a lecture he gave in 1907 at the University of Oxford, where he was uh, uh, chancellor, uh, had the following to say, I quote, protectorates shade away by imperceptible degrees into the diplomatic concept now popularly known as spheres of influence. It implies a stage at which no exterior power but one may assert itself in the territory so described. The native government is as a rule left undisturbed. Indeed, its unabated sovereignty is sometimes specifically reaffirmed. But commercial expectation and political influence are regarded as the peculiar right of the interested power. No body of rules can, however, be laid down. For it is obvious that a sphere of influence in a still independent kingdom like Persia must be very different from a sphere of influence among the semi-barbarous tribes of the, of the Bahr al-Ghazel or the Niger. Note that he says still independent, right? This means that basically the idea was that at one point uh, Persia would uh, join the rest of the uh, colonized uh, world in Asia. Now, um, Iran, in other words, uh, seemed uh, doomed. Can I have image seven, please? And here you see what the result was, uh, because uh, um, given that the north of the country with all its wealth, uh, the capital of the country were in the Russian zone, the Russians basically started throwing their weight around. Uh, and this, some people in England objected to that, uh, uh, but you see the, uh, the British lion uh, looks on as uh, the British, as the Russian bear, um, puts his weight on uh, Persia. Many people in Britain didn't like what was happening, but the Russian alliance uh, took precedence over the interests of uh, Iran uh, because of the German threat. So uh, that's how the Russians became uh, dominant uh, in Iran, so much so uh, that the country's independence seemed to be doomed. And by 1915, Lenin coined the term semi-colony uh, when he wrote that uh, China, Turkey, and Persia were semi-colonies, since in reality they are now 90% uh, colonies. Uh, World War I had a paradoxical effect uh, on Iran. First of all, it devastated it, because the Russians were present, uh, present in the north of Iran, which meant that uh, the Ottomans entered Iran as well, and Russians and Ottomans fought on Iranian territory, causing enormous misery. Uh, the British were also then present in the, the south of Iran to counter the Ottomans on the other side of, uh, from India. And so Iran basically a theater became a theater of warfare, even though the government had declared its neutrality. So Iranian neutrality was officially disregarded by all the powers, Russians, British, and, uh, and uh, Ottomans. And one of the uh, aspects of this uh, war that is not widely known is that a genocide took place in Iran because the 1915 genocide of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire spilled over to Iranian territory uh, occupied by Ottoman and Russian uh, troops and so Kurdish tribes descended from the mountains and uh, killed about two-thirds of the Christian population of uh, northwestern Iran. This is the Assyrian genocide of uh, 1915. The Iranian government had nothing to do with it. It's not like the Ottoman government, which had planned the genocide. In Iran, the Iranian government simply had no control over most of uh, the country. 
And uh, while the uh, uh, World War I essentially devastated Iran and Iran fell apart because the government had little control over the country outside of Tehran, uh, the Bolshevik revolution then saved uh, Iran's uh, independence because Lenin um, was, a, uh, was sympathetic to non to Asian powers and uh, in his view, in his development of Marxism, he uh, had argued that uh, Marxists and communists had to ally with national bourgeois elements in countries like China and uh, Iran and Turkey and so on in order to counter imperialism. Uh, and so uh, just as uh, you know, the, the communists in China made a deal with the Guomindang, uh, in uh, Iran too, uh, uh, the uh, Russians, uh, tried to have friendly relations with the post-World War I Iranian uh, government. They abolished the uh, uh, capitulations. Uh, they abolished the advantages they had received in treaties. They forgave Iran its debts uh, towards Russia. And the Iranian government after World War I gradually tried to, uh, to do away with uh, the capitulations. One important step was a treaty that was signed with China in 1921. Uh, and this treaty was actually important for both China and for Iran because they signed it for the same reason. Now, China-Iranian relations were really not important enough in 1921 to warrant a treaty, but the treaty was signed uh, because in it, both countries renounced extraterritorial, extraterritorial rights for the other. Uh, and they uh, both tried to make this a precedent for the renegotiations of treaties with the capitulary powers. Um, and uh, then uh, gradually laws were written, um, codes were produced, commercial codes, procedural codes, criminal codes. All of this basically happens uh, between, say, 1919 and uh, 1926, 27. And once all these uh, legal codes were in place, a law school had been created. Uh, laws were passed that judges had to be the graduates of law schools uh, that had been, of the law school that had been established. In other words, once a court system, a modern court system is put in place in the 1920s, the government felt, um, felt uh, secure enough to uh, announce the abolition of the uh, capitulations. Uh, in the meantime, uh, one step towards a full membership in the Committee of Nations uh, was accomplished, namely Iran became a founding member of the League of Nations. Uh, and uh, then in 1926, uh, it signed the Anti-Slavery Convention. Uh, and so uh, slavery was abolished soon uh, thereafter. Uh, of course, the abolition of slavery was one of the criteria of the standard of civilization. Uh, and uh, once uh, slavery had been uh, abolished and legal codes were in place, in 1928, uh, the Iranian government notified the capitulary powers that it considered the capitulations to be abolished, the unequal treaties to be abolished. And uh, at that point, uh, the powers agreed. Uh, the powers agreed. And so in 1928, uh, basically, Iran joins uh, the world, uh, the rest of the world, as a fully uh, sovereign uh, nation. Um, of course, semi colonialism continued. Uh, with the British oil presence uh, in uh, Iran, but that uh, you know that story only ends in 1951 with the nationalization of oil. But from a legal point of view, from a state-to-state -state, uh, point of view, 1928 is the date uh, in which Iran gains uh, full sovereignty. Exactly 100 years after the Turkmen Shai. Uh, treaties with Russia that established the first capitulations uh, in Iran. Um, and so, unlike the Chinese century of humiliations, which, la which lasted 110 years, the Iranian century of humiliation actually lasted only 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shang, for that uh, lovely talk. Uh, it was an excellent presentation 
of putting together the influences that impacted uh, Iran's diplomatic history uh, and Iran's constitutionalism uh, and semi-colonial and uh, treaty relations. Uh, also, it was great to see the pictorial representations of the interactions of various uh, countries in diplomacy and state building. So uh, uh, we can now start taking uh, questions uh, from our audience. Uh, so uh, uh, if, if we can have questions in the chat box and uh, uh, Dr. Prabhakar, if you would like to speak something. First of all, thank you very much for this um, presentation. It was very rich, uh, as was expected. Uh, we learned a lot, lot of information to actually process um, uh, uh, because we are primarily lawyers and um, we had this wonderful uh, history and legal history of Iran's um, uh, becoming an equal member of the League of Nations. Uh, clearly, as Indians, uh, I'm Indian here, so uh, we, we also sometimes compare ourselves with other Asian powers and how they lived. And one of the, one of the reasons why, <clears throat> as an international lawyer, we are interested in studying Iran and Siam is because of its semi-colonialism and how it was able to actually uh, protect its sovereignty. So as a, as, 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 a, as, as, a, as a matter of method for us lawyers, we say Asia, but Asia is quite diverse from Japan to uh, Ottoman uh, Turkey. Uh, we have a great diversity in the way in the which in, in the way in which Asian uh, states gained independence or, or got uh, integrated into uh, the global system or as we call it the universalization of international law. I mean, uh, I'm still processing the information, but uh, uh, it would be uh, good to have uh, some more information on how uh, the, 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 the protege, the, the, you know, the role of protege, because that, that also I find very interesting in relation to Siam, because use of protege was actually one of the ways to acquire territory. So what happens in Siam is that, that the French government, uh, you know, uh, gets projects and then pushes non-Siamese uh, as laborers in that region. And then later that becomes a way to, because you know, you know, the, you know, it's not always the territory is not always clear. So protege, uh, you know, become a way for them to actually ask for more territory subsequently, or the movement of protege becomes a way to actually expand their territory. So uh, some information on that on how that panned out in Iran would be interesting. Thank you. Mm. Uh, in Iran, there were fewer proteges. There were fewer proteges. I mean, in Siam, you know that, uh, you know, all Indonesians could be proteges uh, because of the French, all Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians could be proteges. So you have a gigantic population of, uh, of proteges, the same in the Ottoman Empire and Iran uh, and China. But in Iran, on the, on, the, uh, on the whole, there were fewer of them. Uh, they were fewer of them, but the Russians did try to settle uh, some parts of northern Iran. So uh, villages were created where Russians were brought in uh, to buy agricultural land. And this was uh, seen at the time as an attempt to gradually move uh, south. So uh, I'm not aware of any uh, connection between the protege system and territorial gains. Uh, in Iran because the boundaries of Iran were all um, uh, set by treaties. Um, a number of treaties were signed with Russia and of course the loss continued. Even in the early 20th century, Iran had to abandon a few border towns uh, to, uh, to Russia. But uh, this, uh, this was distinct from the, uh, from the protégé system. The protégé system, the, the damage it did to Iran essentially was that uh, Iranians, Iranian merchants or princes or rich people uh, could befriend a foreign embassy and gain protégé status and therefore be immune from Iranian law. So some Iranian subjects could literally get away with murder and theft and corruption because they were outside the uh, the legal grasp of the uh, of the Iranian government. But I, I'm not aware of any direct connection with territorial gain. 
So my second question is also uh, uh, in relation to, um, so there's something similar happening in Japan, um, Siam and, uh, and Persia is because these are semi colonies and they had treaty relations, however unequal. One of the ways to get rid of uh, their inequality in treaty relations is by legal reforms. Uh, so, 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 and, and that is, and I find this very interesting because when you compare a semi colony such as Iran with India, Indian, Indian laws were made actually by the British, you know, after 1857. So direct is yeah. a common law country, but they just drafted our laws uh, on a large scale and everything was fixed by them. And then, uh, and then of course, courts and then interpretation of law that uh, begins, but it was drafted by them. Whereas in the case of Japan, uh, Siam or Iran, um, these countries, uh, monarchies or otherwise, imported lawyers from outside, Europeans mostly, for the reforms of the law, right? So, uh, uh, so I'm Belgians, not, Belgians way, and Siam, yeah. Like, 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 in, like in Siam, Siam, Siam has got a Belgian because uh, the Belgian was equally, uh, you know, uh, is right in between the French and, and, and the British, so, you know, so, you know it's, so they had to get someone who actually is, is, is who's, who can be trusted as a lawyer as well, because the lawyer is also the diplomat. The lawyer is not only a lawyer at the time. So can you tell us a bit more about how this happened in, in, in Tehran and yeah. uh, its connection to the opening of law school? Because I find that also a very interesting idea uh, because uh, as we can see in our neighborhood, uh, very recently Bhutan opens its law school and the king particularly wanted the law school. And, and, and my first reaction was, I understand it as, as a historical process. Uh, Bhutan is sandwiched between India and China. So they have to have a law school to say, look, we have our laws, we have our civilization, we are doing our best. We are a rule of law. We cannot be rule of law without having a law school, right? Yeah. So, so that uh, you'd like to know more about, a bit more about Iran uh, yeah. on, 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 on its reform in this law school. But we also have uh, two questions, but after this, yeah. So basically uh, the big model for Iran was the Tanzimat and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and uh, throughout the 19th century, you have periods when a reformist grand vizier takes over the administration of the country. On, this happens on two occasions, actually, uh, and starts reforms. Now, both of these two reformist grand viziers have spent a lot of time in the Ottoman Empire. And so they were directly influenced by them. Uh, but as I said, they, they don't succeed. Uh, one of them is actually killed by the Shah, the other one dies in obscurity, uh, because the, at the end of the day, the Shahs did not want to part with their powers, right? So uh, it's only after, but foreigners are brought in for other purposes, for administrative purposes. For instance, uh, around the turn of the century, Belgians are brought in to take over the Iranian customs system. So I think one of the, uh, one of the uh, interesting dissertations that could be written in global history was uh, Belgium in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, a small country that is not a threat to anybody, but which is the second country which has had a, a um, uh, industrial revolution, far advanced, monarchical, but liberal at the same time. So uh, that would be a very interesting uh, book to write, Belgium in Asia. Uh, so in Iran, customs is put under Belgian uh, control, uh, for instance. But um, uh, the, uh, the constitution of 1906 is patterned on the Belgian constitution, right? Uh, and uh, one of its authors was a diplomat who had ser served for a long time in Brussels, right? Uh, but then uh, the Belgian constitution was too liberal because the constitution was to enshrine the, uh, uh, the primacy of the 12 Shi'i faith in Iran. Uh, and for that, they turned to the Bulgarian constitution uh, because the Bulgarian constitution enshrined the primacy of the Orthodox church. And so those were adapted mutatis mutandis to uh, the Iranian uh, constitution, right? Um, uh, it was after the parliament uh, began functioning and uh, you had a constitution that legal codes were written uh, in Iran and uh, they were written by Iranians actually. You know, it comes much later. Uh, and uh, so at this point, parliament 
is dismissed uh, for much of the time after 1906. Iran actually didn't have a sitting parliament for all sorts of political reasons. But when it does, uh, commissions are put together and uh, laws are being written. And for instance, personal law uh, is uh, very much influenced by the Sharia. So we have a personal code, uh, but uh, the provisions for inheritance, for instance, are taken straight from the Sharia. So it's basically Iranian lawyers sitting together with 12 Ashi Mujtahids to write a code uh, which will in, in its form be European, but its content be in conformity with the Sharia, right? Uh, then you have criminal codes, commercial codes, and all of these are written by writers. Uh, but they take European models. So they take a little bit from the Swiss code, a little bit from the French code, uh, etc. And uh, my Iranian lawyer friends tell me that uh, they are masterpieces of legal reasoning and of clarity of language, because many terms had to be coined. Iran um, never became, uh, never lost the use of the Persian language. So all these codes, all the constitution was written in Persian. Now, if you import concepts, you have to create new words for it also. So uh, apparently they were very, very successful uh, in, uh, in the creation of this uh, legal system. There's a good book on it uh, actually, which has been published uh, in England, the development of the Iranian legal system in the 19th. Uh, uh, 20s. When exactly the law school was created, the year I don't remember offhand. I mean, I could find out easily, uh, but I don't want to waste your time looking up things in a book. So, uh, but uh, it was a big, uh, it was a big transition uh, and created some tensions with the clergy because the clergy lost their monopoly uh, over of the Sharia courts uh, at the expense of the secular lawyers. But even here, this shouldn't be exaggerated because many clerics just turned, took off their turban, shaved, put on a tie, took a two-year course at the law school and continued being judges. Right. So um, in a sense, uh, it, was, it, it was a domestic uh, uh, reform, much less, in, uh, much less influenced by uh, outsiders like, for instance, the Siebold in, in Japan, or uh, uh, people like that. We have some questions, uh, uh, Ajita. We can't get all of them now, but we can just ask a few. So we have three questions. Uh, so first question is from Aman, who is a faculty at Jinder Global Law School. Uh, does Iran use the language vocabulary of self-determination in the league or any time post that? or something akin to that? Uh, I have, in the League of Nations. Um, I have not studied it, but I have anecdotal evidence uh, that it did. Uh, and in particular with Afro-Americans, uh, the, um, uh, the Iranian missions uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the League in Geneva at one point uh, had very close relations with uh, African-Americans. Uh, the, uh, uh, when Ethiopia was sort of uh, uh, in, a, in a shaky situation, the Iranian consulate in New York City uh, facilitated uh, meetings and support by African-Americans in support of Ethiopia, the only independent uh, state uh, in Africa. Uh, and so on the whole, they were, uh, they were sympathetic. They were sympathetic to the uh, non-European world. But whether they used the rhetoric of self-determination, I don't know. So we have another uh, question by Julia Kloss. Um, Julia says, thank you for the fantastic talk, which reminded her uh, about uh, uh, something that she, uh, Julia doesn't know uh, about uh, Iran's semi-colonial history and international relations and law. Uh, then she says that many of Iran's attempt to assimilate to Western civilization standard uh, remind her of Japan's strategy after Meiji rest restora restoration. 
uh, Japan even went so far to imitate Western colonialism in Taiwan, Korea, Sakhalin, and eventually Manchuria. Were there any comparable colonialist attempt by Iran, maybe post-1928? Um, no, I'm sure many leaders of Iran would have loved to do that. Uh, but the country was uh, so weak that uh, there was no, uh, no, uh, um, no serious attempt. I mean, they were lucky that they could keep their own sovereignty. Uh, the one area uh, which uh, comes to mind is the island of Bahrain. Uh, because um, Iran throughout the 19th century and uh, the early 20th century never gave up its claim on Bahrain. Um, and uh, it actually uh, could produce, the, there's a, there was a, an understanding, a memorandum between the British and the Iranians in which the British admitted that uh, Bahrain was a tributary state of, uh, uh, of Iran, uh, but uh, you know, they never had the means to fight the British uh, for uh, Bahrain, and that claim was given up in 1971. And Iran actually became the first country to recognize the independence of Bahrain in uh, 1971, so no. There's another question by Sayyid Ali Akhtar, uh, and Sayyid asks, should we see Anglo-Iranian oil refinery and overthrowing of Mozadegh government as manifestation of semi-colonial legacy, since the zone of influence terminology is quite relevant to our times as well. Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the British uh, presence uh, in, uh, in southeastern, uh, southwestern Iran uh, had many aspects of, uh, of semi-colonialism. Uh, for instance, there was a neighborhood in the city of Abadan called Brame, which is where the British uh, and their Indian uh, uh, employees lived, uh, and uh, that was basically self-governed. Um, I don't think the Iranian government could, uh, you know, could appoint a mayor uh, for uh, Brain. Uh, they practiced strict separation. I mean, there were water fountains which had the sign "Not for Persians," right? Uh, so even water fountains were uh, segregated. Um, but here, the, uh, uh, again, from a legal point of view, uh, the matter is a bit complicated because the concession had been granted to a British businessman, Darcy. And so uh, this was an agreement between a British business uh, and Iran, not between the British state and Iran. However, the British, had a, the British government had acquired a majority of the shares of that company. So what lay behind the company, which later became BP in the end, what laid behind that company was the British state, right? And so all of this ambiguity was played out at the International Court of Justice, where uh, the British sued Iran after the nationalization of oil in 1951, and Prime Minister Mossadegh, who was himself a lawyer, and recently I discovered a pamphlet that he wrote in 1914 against capitulations. Uh, that is a, um, a relatively unknown uh, aspect of his life. Uh, so he went to Geneva and argued Iran's case, arguing that the ICJ uh, does not have jurisdiction because this is about a British company uh, and the Iranian government. Um, and um, he won a victory. The ICJ pronounced itself uh, incompetent in this, uh, in this uh, matter. So, uh, yes, the nationalization of Iranian oil in 1951, I think, put, uh, put an end to a semi-colonial enclave. I wouldn't say that Iran became a semi-colony because of oil, but uh, I would say that Abadan and the Iranian oil industry were a semi-colonial situation in an otherwise sovereign state. Uh, the next question is from Professor Anne-Sophie from Sciences Po. Um, thank you. She says, thank you for your great presentation. You've mentioned the Berlin Conference of in 1885, and this raises the following question. How did the Iranian diplomats, jurists, and politicians perceive the different major treaties in the 19th century regarding the Eastern question, and more particularly the Treaty of Constantinople of 1832, the Treaty of Paris of 1856, and the Treaty of Berlin of 1878? 
Um, these issues were discussed. Uh, I mean, when you read the uh, the uh, uh, diaries of court officials, for instance, uh, you see that uh, you know today I went and saw the Shah, and we talked about this treaty, we talked about that treaty. Uh, but I think Iran was basically too weak to uh, to be an actor in these things. I mean, the uh, 1857 treaty, the Paris Treaty uh, with Britain, uh, affected Iran directly because it uh, sealed the separation of Herat uh, from uh, Iran um, after 1950, 1858. Uh, but uh, for instance, the Ottoman Empire was a signatory to the 1885 uh, Berlin Treaty. Iran was not, there was no reason. I mean, Iran had no ambitions in Africa. In 1885, the Ottomans still had Libya, uh, and so they were interested in, uh, in what goes on in Africa, but uh, not Iran. So I think this was uh, perceived from a distance uh, without much engagement. Okay, uh, with that last intervention, we've come to an end of a wonderful session. I thank you, Professor Shahabi, for uh, giving us valuable time and agreeing to deliver a talk. Um, thank you very much for having invited me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for your good question. Thank you, everyone, for listening to us. Thank, thank you. you.